Thanks to everyone for coming today. I'm Joe Cartafalsa from the ILR Alumni Association, uh, class of 1989. I'm very happy to introduce Ken Sunshine, class of 1970. Um, Ken has had various careers in media and politics. Um, when he was in his 40s, he got bit by the entrepreneurial bug. And I am going to let Ken tell that story because he'll tell it a lot better than I do. So Ken? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I, <clears throat> I'm very used to being behind the scenes planning things like this, so it's, uh, a lot of my clients are, uh, are intrigued what the hell I'm going to say because you know, I tend not to be so careful when I'm giving advice. In front of the camera, we'll try to be a little careful at the beginning, and then in the q and I'm going to go for it, so you know, just <laughs> a a ask, ask anything you want and uh, God knows what I'm going to respond to. Um, you know, I, when I entered, coming back here, whenever I come back here, it's, you get nostalgic when you're, you know, an 18-year-old kid, and you know you see this majestic campus, and you don't know. You, you, anybody that says they weren't a little insecure or scared or, you know, what is this about? And my, am, am I a grown-up now? Is probably lying. And um, I felt that same pang that I felt some 50 odd years ago uh, coming coming here for, and doing this. And probably a little trepidation about my, my autobiography in maybe a half hour or so. The one thing I've had is a great variety of experiences. And I took a unique experience at Cornell and in the ILR school to learn certain tenets about my, myself and, and frankly, desire, my desire to impact the world became a dominant force, for better or for worse. You know. If you're Donald Trump, it's for worse. If you're other, the other side of the ledger may be a little bit better. But more than that, if you, there's one takeaway before I start doing my thing, is that a non-traditional, a very, very unusual series of paths can be fulfilling on some level, can be successful on a, on a material level, but can also fit who you are. Because let me tell you, when I got to Cornell, I don't know what the hell I was doing or what, what, what the world was about. It was a very innocent time, and it was a very naivete. And compared to what you guys know, particularly you know, not only social media and, and instant communication, but just the sophistication about the world. I think we were more innocent, and I think we were a little less cynical. And then I got caught up in, well, we'll talk about it after uh, when I get to that. This is not going to be you know, soup to nuts. I'm not, it's not going to be strictly chronological, but it's going to follow my path on some level. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn when Brooklyn was not cool. You know? <laughs> now, now Brooklyn's the coolest place in the world. And my parents, like a lot of people of that generation, got the hell out of Brooklyn. And, I regret it now. I, what did I know back then? I grew up on Long Island in uh, suburban New York. Not the most affluent area, but I'd love to tell people I was really poor. I wasn't poor, but I was, it's more exciting to say that, but we were middle class. Very innocent time. I got to say, and I guess it's an advantage, I don't think too many traumatic things happened to me. My parents spoiled us. I, when I was very young, I was a really good basketball player, uh, and they thought, like, exceptionally good. At about 14 or 15, I think I started peaking, and by 16, I was, in, I was just a skinny white guy that was okay. And I had visions of playing at Cornell, I remember, and I think I tried out. It, anyway, it didn't, it didn't quite work out. But the you know, suburban living, being isolated, I, I went to a school that was almost entirely white. I think we had one African-American kid. I think she left. And we weren't affluent, so it was very, very isolated and isolating. I had the advantage as I had an eccentric grandmother who lived in Manhattan. My parents, when we were very little, we always went into Manhattan because I'd lived not far from Manhattan. And another part of the world, particularly cultural, became part of my DNA. And I was just interested in diversity and difference. And as much as I fit in really well, maybe too well for my own good, in the very pristine suburban environment, I wanted more, and I wanted more of the world. I got into Cornell, and here I was. And um, the one thing I, you know, I, I picked a couple of slides uh, showing 
the one thing I remember is this was my dream when I started. This is my high school basketball team. And I was pretty good. I was still OK here, starting to go down. You know, the skinny guy on the lower left was uh, me. It's a little dorky, I know. And you know, we looked a little different. That was a big part of me. You know, I, and sports was just a great outlet. I went to camp, and I, uh, I, I think a bit unusual for what I ended up doing right after that. But the innocence of suburbia in that era, I think, worked for me. I don't think it worked for society. I think we were way too isolated from the reality of America in that time. And then I got to Cornell, and I got caught up in the anti-war civil rights world big time. And it, frankly, it was dominating the campus. And I had occasion to have lunch with uh, you know, one of the professors who wrote a book about the history of Cornell and modern era and a lot about that time. It was dominating. We had classes canceled a lot. It was the days of the student movement. and. Uh, this was uh, a photo I found in my archive of uh, campus protests all the time. And I, w I was right in there. And I thought that, you know, I, what I did not think of is how that leads to um, a career. I never, the word career never, meant, never entered my mind. Um, I knew I wanted to change the world, but how that existed from demonstrating around Ives Hall, didn't, one, didn't, one and one didn't make two. But what I did get caught up with is incredibly important, interesting, dynamic, crazy people who were part of that era. And we, um, ROTC on campus was a big issue. Yeah, again, it all had to do with the anti-Vietnam War uh, uh, goals. And we had marches, demonstrations, pickets. And then, frankly, things got really radical. And people were going to Washington all the time. And that was cool. And some people got arrested. I didn't get arrested much in those days. I almost did a couple of times. But I, I, not that I, I would have done it. But it was, it was the, 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 the distinction between people who are going to put themselves out there and go for it and people who may want another alternative within the system, and that was me. Always that tension between how are we going to make change? Is it going to be within the Democratic Party? Or is it going to be by taking over buildings and causing a revolution? I was emotionally tied to the latter. My career, maybe a little more of the former. And then this happened. And this is the front page of Newsweek, where African American students took over the straight and came out with guns. And I was friends with a lot of the, a lot of the people. And I've remained friends with, with some. Um, and some of the white students were picketing in support of the students. But that was pretty shocking. You know, This is in the middle of uh, Cornell, an Ivy League campus in the middle of Ithaca, New York. And people are that, uh, it, it is dramatic a photo as the one we saw here. Thus, again, the, the tension that I, that I talked about. Um, I ended up doing the clean for Gene thing. Gene McCarthy ran for president as the anti-Vietnam War candidate in 1968. And I went from picketing the straight to cutting my hair and cleaning up a little bit and trying to get people to vote for McCarthy as the anti-Vietnam War candidate. Um, we, one summer, it was the summer of 68. There, were, there was a, a, a Catholic priest, I think he was a chaplain, Father Dan Berrigan, who became very famous, the Berrigan brothers, um, in anti-Vietnam War activities. And he organized a project, a pa the Power Project, project to organize white, whites to eliminate racism. A little pompous and a little self-important. But we went to Yonkers, New York, and caused hell, raised hell in Yonkers and challenged discriminatory laws and exclusionary housing laws. And we lived there for a couple of months, and, and Father Dan was our, was our leader. Uh, there was another Catholic uh, priest, Father Dave Connor, who I got close to, again, very politically active. Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King got assassinated that cycle, you know, spring, beginning of summer of 68. And it caused traumatic you know, reaction, to say the least, in the world and affected the body politic. And, and uh, 
I probably would have ended up as a Kennedy person as opposed to a McCarthy. But Kennedy was starting to, to gain a lot of momentum and probably would have been the nominee. And I dare say he would have been president. Um, in the end, Humphrey lost, and we had Nixon, and we had a lot of wars, and Nixon got kicked. You know, you know the history. It was pretty dramatic. And we lived all, you know, I lived in my way uh, through it. Um, Cornell for me was a lot of politics, some a little weird and, and, and radical, and also a lot of fun. You know, it was the uh, sexual revolution was happening. You know, it was, I think, women's roles were being challenged on a very dramatic basis. Um, I also was a bit of a jock, you know, even though I wasn't as talented athletically anymore. The hockey team was like the national champs then. I used to go to all the hockey games um, and still play basketball like I, like I was pretty good. Um, I would drive, you know, I, we had a, we flew up here and, um, and uh, had a nightmarish experience staying at Newark Airport. I remember in those days, I used to drive all the time to New York and just drove all over without, uh, without much care. You know, 17 didn't, you had to go through Roscoe, New York to get up here, and you had to stop at the Roscoe Diner. I remember one time, I was the driver of a bunch of friends of mine, and it was very, it was starting to snow, and we had to have snow tires in those days. We didn't have snow tires. Myself and my friends were trying to figure out how to change a tire. I wasn't really good at that. And these hunters came by with bloody deer on the, I almost fainted from the, Deer, and they, I see the guns, and oh my God, and these guys were so nice. They changed the tire for us. Remember at the Roscoe Diner? I figured there's a little bit of a culture class here. Maybe, you know, we can talk later about white working class voting for Donald Trump and people like me maybe feeling a little removed. You know, there's, there's a little method into the man. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, anyway, we uh, I graduated, sort of. I mean, we, we protested at the graduation. It was a mild protest. I think we, the caps were the other way. I don't, I don't remember. Some, we, we did some, something to show the, our uh, disdain for authority. And what's my career going to be? I'm out of Cornell. And I went, my mother was working in a community center in the poor community of Freeport on Long Island. I was really living in the city. But I would go out there. I ended up hiring, getting hired as a group worker, worked with gangs and kids in trouble. And, I, this is a kind of cool thing to do. Um, and then I get recruited to run for office as a candidate to the Democratic National Convention for George McGovern. George McGovern was the anti-Vietnam War candidate. Uh, he ended up running against Ed Muskie, a senator from Maine, who was a good guy, but a little bit establishment. McGovern was more my style. And we were in a hotly contested race on Long Island, and I was not your typical politician. Um, Newsday, which is the local paper on Long Island, you probably know. I know it's a really dorky photo. And um, there's a part of this that is kind of funny. It, it, they say about me as a convention, uh, say what you want about Kenneth Sunshine. They called me Kenneth then. He does not look like some kind of wheeling, dealing, pot belly, cigar smoking ward healer who has been hammering out political deals from the back of a smoke-filled room for the last 40 years. Kenneth Sunshine is 24. He's thin, wears white collar length hair, blue jeans, no socks. He drives a 1964 Buick convertible with 100,000 miles on it and about 100,000 holes in it. Much of the canvas roof is held together with electrical tape. The doors and fenders have the quality of severe acne. Now that is some car. Um, is this a car of a delegate to the National Convention, he asks. Back seat filled with political literature, windows still jammed with papers. No one must concede, but that concession is wrong. That was me. Guess what? We won. We beat the establishment Democrats. I became a delegate to the Democratic National Convention. Um, and I was going to change the world. And McGovern was going to win. And I'd go to the White House, and we would have peace. McGovern lost 49 of 50 states. He won the District of Columbia and Massachusetts. And I said, what the hell is going on with this country? I, you know, I'm all there. Anyway, during the campaign, one really good thing happened. There was, I would be campaigning, and I was in Great Neck on Long Island, and uh, a big mouth redhead kid made, kept asking all kinds of questions, a precocious high school kid. And we got kind of friendly, and we weren't dating, but a couple of years later, we were dating, and 
Uh, Nancy Hollander and I have been married for like ever, and we have two kids, and she's here, you know, as part of the journey. Uh, a lot of couples meet in political campaigns. It's one good thing about it. Uh, anyway, this is our family, uh, son Jason, who's at Columbia Law School, our daughter Jessica, who's going to take on Broadway and conquer that very soon. Uh, she graduated college last year, and that's uh, Jason's girlfriend, Samantha. Where the hell is that? I think that's in Japan or someplace on a family trip. Anyway, Democratic Convention, I meet all these cool people. Uh, I was attracted to writers and journalists. Uh, Jimmy Breslin became a, a, a mentor of mine. I met him at the Democratic Convention. Jack Newfield became one of my best friends and, and a big mentor of mine. They're both deceased, but I spent many years with them. I, I, I would drive them. They're big, big boxing fans. We'd go to boxing matches in Atlantic City, godforsaken place. Guess who the promoter of the fights was that would give us tickets? Donald, yeah, he, he, was the, he was the promoter. He would give us big hugs and, oh, the great, I love writers. He's addicted to the press. He just, anything, anybody that had anything to do with the media, he would work. And I was a very minor player then, but I, he kind of took on to me. I got to know him a bit. It was all about getting his name uh, in the press. Um, McGovern loses, I, get, I start working in politics. I worked for Bronx, then Bronx Borough President Bob Abrams. I went to the Bronx every day, the Bronx County Courthouse. I still know, know every neighborhood in the Bronx. They conduct community meetings. Some crazy reason, I, I don't know, I didn't have normal fear of you know, somebody looking like me going in these areas. Never had anything terrible happen to me. Um, but we, I was forming a career as somewhat of a, a political consultant. At the Democratic Convention, I had met Bella Abzug. Bella Abzug was the anti-Vietnam War feminist leader. She wore big hats. She was loud. She was big. She was great. And they don't make politicians like that anymore. Bella, I, became, I worked for Bella for years. I became her personal assistant, body person, we called that. And she had quite a body. And she was, she, was, she was terrific. She kept losing elections, though. She was supposed to be mayor. She lost the mayor. Koch ended up winning. She had lost the Senate seat before that and then ran for Congress and didn't win. I learned to lose a lot. Um, when Bella lost the primary, there was a runoff between uh, Ed Koch and Mario Cuomo. We all endorsed Cuomo because he was against the death penalty. It became a big issue in New York in that, that day. And Koch was for the death penalty. And we go marching over to the Cuomo headquarters. He didn't have cell phones. He just went over to the headquarters. We're going to endorse you. And there's this kind of hulking young bodyguard blocking us, you know, and I was, I don't look like it, but I was kind of brave. I said, uh, we're here to see uh, Mario Cuomo. So this big hulking young bodyguard said, well, who the hell are you? I said, well, who the hell are you? It was his son, Andrew, who was a kid then. <laughs> and that's how we met. Uh, he, there's no secret, we're very close friends, have an odd friendship. Um, and yet, it's a very special friendship. Uh, he ain't no bodyguard. He's about as smart and as tough as they, ca they come. Uh, this is his dad, Mario, who was a very special person. One of the greatest speeches ever made for liberals, progressives, was Mario Cuomo's speech at the Democratic Convention, 1984, I believe, in San Francisco. And he embodied inspiring through speeches, through articulation, through thinking bigger than the goal that most politicians are about. And it's no secret where my politics lie, where my prejudice, I, I admit it, you know, that you know, I'm an old-fashioned liberal progressive from the old school. But it was a more benign era. Republicans and Democrats talked to each other. They made deals. They, you know, Tip O'Neill would yell and scream at Ronald Reagan, and they would have a beer, and they'd work out the budget deal. You can't do that anymore. Uh, but Cuomo was the best of New York liberalism, and he never ran for president. Too, too bad. He would have been, he would have been just uh, great. I worked for Jimmy Carter in 76. Um, I, never, I didn't get to know him well, but I was in the eastern part of America. Uh, and I remember they offered me a job in the White House. I didn't want to take that because I'm a New Yorker. I was doing my thing in New York. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I'm missing. I don't want to, I've been around so long, I get embroiled in all kinds of details about all the intervening years. I worked against Jimmy Carter for somebody that I really got to know and love dearly, 
Senator Ted Kennedy, who took on incumbent President Carter, almost won, and made that incredible speech at Madison Square Garden at the convention, you know, the dream never dies, and reflecting the Kennedys and all the tragedies that it had there. Um, but I had developed a real friendship. This, this is later. You know, I have a little gray hair. He has a lot of gray hair. But again, go, go through archives and footage and watch some of the speeches that Ted Kennedy made and, and what the Kennedys stand for. And I've been close to many Kennedys. Um, you know, the tragedy that happened around that family is un inexplicable. And ironically, yesterday they released the Warren Committee papers. And all. It's, it's fascinating anyway. Um, I had had it with politics. I didn't like being a political consultant. We didn't call us that. I was too idealistic. I was pretty good at it, I think. I people that wanted to hire me, but I wanted to make a career change. What did you mean? I said, well, entertainment, I don't know, I have no talent. I, I never went, I was never any plays at Cornell, never played in the marching band or anything like that. But I just had an affinity there. I knew some people. I became a journalist briefly, and I went to work for ASCAP in the music business. And I was in the PR department. Oh, I'm going to learn PR. Um, the, um, the craziness of that era in the rock and roll world, where I spent much of my time, and in the pop music world, we were working on copyright legislation, but we were also working just with rock and rollers to protect their, their rights. Um, and I got to meet a who's who of the rock and roll world, and it was sort of the beginning of this sort of celebrity uh, world that I ended up doing some work with later. Um, Somehow, I'm going to a Rolling Stones concert, and a bodyguard comes over and says, you, you, backstage. And the promoter, who I was working for, said, I think you're getting busted. I said, well, busted? Oh, my god. Do I have anything in my pocket? What, you know? <laughs> and I rushed to Mick Jagger's dressing room, and he looks at me. He remembers this better than I do. He says, perfect. I became double. We used to look alike. And I, this, is, this is an old picture. Oh, god. I need to get rid of this. It's embarrassing. Anyway. Um, so the real Mick would go in and out of the concerts in an ambulance, and the fake Mick with a hat, people screaming, and they'd throw things and all that. And then, then I think we got fired. I don't remember. It's all a little hazy in those, that era anyway. <laughs> but at, at ASCAP, we did events for Paul McCartney, for Elton John, for mm -hmm. Stevie Wonder, who I was pretty friendly with, at Bruce Springsteen, et cetera. And we did these events for um, celebrating pop music successes. Prince exploded as a new superstar right at the beginning. And he's coming to this event at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. I'm Mr. PR genius by then. I'm organizing everything. And I told his manager, then manager, I said, look, don't come with bodyguards. Come, like, because you know, he's always surrounded by those hulking bodyguards. He comes in the front door, and there are 50 photographers going completely insane. And I said, oh my god, you're supposed to come in the back door. Follow me. And he and I are charging through the ballroom, which had been set up. Glasses are breaking. Paparazzis are screaming. And I said, follow me. So he says, where are we going? I said, come on. I had no idea where we go. I end up I go into the, I see this door open. I come, come in, Prince. I'm in a closet with Prince. <laughs> and photographers are banging at the door and screaming. And the bodyguards are pushing people away. And I remember him, he's like this big. And he's like, what do we do now, big shot? You know, and he had this kind of playful way. And 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm at the hotel. You know, the hotel phone rings, and it's my mother. And I said, Mom, it's 5 in the morning. I don't care. It's 8 o'clock. I just heard on the radio, were you in a closet with some prince? <laughs> Explain it to me. That's part of the uh, things that happen in this crazy thing. I did all the PR. I, I helped supervise the PR for the original Live Aid in the 80s. That was the first big concert uh, for a cause with every superstar you can, you can get. Um, and I did a lot of work in the entertainment business. I had, somebody told me, save all your backstage passes. I probably got thousands of a little photo of for every event. And it's not only music events, but you know, conventions, political events, and all that. And I don't know. I'll will it to somebody at some point. But it's a, a kind of cool thing in my office. People are always saying, oh, this, this is what you've been doing all this time. Um, at a certain point, I was ready for a career change. Um, I, had, I sort of knew what I was, could, could do something in the PR world. And the political bug hit me. One of my best friends was a, a big guy named Bill Lynch, who was leading uh, 
political organizer in New York, and he calls me in to meet David Dinkins. David Dinkins, I knew slightly not well, and he says, look, the two of them kind of made me an offer I couldn't refuse. He says, we need a white boy who's going to say no to the brothers. You're it. You've got to help run the campaign. We're going to elect the first black mayor of New York, but you've you got to be you got to be the heavy. Bill looked heavy, but I was the heavy. And leave music business. We, I helped run the campaign for Dinkins against Koch, incumbent Mayor Koch. Racial divisions were very raw in those days. There was, crime was a terrible issue in New York. Urban America was very different then. And uh, we beat Koch handily in the primary. And then there were some issues with bad press. And we're running against this guy, Giuliani, who Giuliani told me later, he said, I, Giuliani, were, I was a terrible candidate in 89 when you beat us, and when I, we beat you four years later, I was much better. Right. Anyway, we did win, and Dinkin prevailed on me. He said, I said, look, I'll do whatever you want, but just for the yeah, Going to the government. So I became his first chief of staff, and we were running things at a tough time in New York's history. And the, the crack epidemic was rampant. I don't know, you guys were alive, but you know of. It's a very different New York now. But we did some terrific things. Dinkins was underrated as a mayor, but he came among the most uh, important influences on me personally. To this day, he's 90 years old, as active and as sharp as could be. Um, and a terrific influence, uh, uh, I think, to New York and to the body politic. Um, when I left the music he gave me a party, and uh, Alan and Marilyn Bergman, two, two of the greatest songwriters uh, in, the, in the world, written many Barbra Streisand hits, uh, were at the party with, with the mayor. And uh, I still looked a little dorky, but I don't know. It's a, a different uh, era. Um, so I'm in government. It's a tough time. Uh, but I'm going to pick out some cool things to do, and important things to do, I, I would think. Nelson Mandela is, rumor has it, he's going to be released from prison, 27 years in, in Robben Island in South African prison. And it captivated the world. His struggle, the struggle against apartheid, that's one of the times I did get arrested at an anti-apartheid demonstration in New York. It was, we had so much fun in jail for a couple of hours, man. You know, it was, and I was like the press guy, so I was doing press releases. And, Jail guards were like sending. We we had some pretty crazy times. Though. Anyway, we're uh, I'm in city government. I'm in uh, chief of staff, and and the mayor and Bill Lynch said, uh, Kenny, you can take this on as your because I think we want to get Mandela to come to New York as the first stop, and the person in charge of by the African National Congress names Harry Belafonte, the famed entertainer and political activist, as in charge of the campaign. I knew Harry. I didn't know him that well. We bonded around this time. And he, I became his right hand. And I basically left, left really working in city government for a month to organize a ticker tape parade uh, uh, for Mandela, which was a pretty cool thing to do. Uh, and then I went on tour with Mandela to five cities. Uh, and it's probably among, not probably, among the most significant experience that I had. I got to know him pretty well. And he was very playful. He was a boxing freak. He had been a boxer when he was young. I was there when he met Muhammad Ali for the first time. Uh, and he, he liked my name. You know, some, they would call me Sunshine and do a little thing. So many years later, he, um, you know, he passes away after an incredible career. And I felt a little nostalgic. I said, you know, I don't even, I, don't, I have all these photos. I have hundreds of photos of all the years. I don't have a photo with Mandela. And I knew I had 100 of them. I don't know where they are, some warehouse or something like that. And I was yelling at my assistant. I said, you know, can't you find one? Pick up the New York Times the next day, and the front page of the New York Times is this photo. And I remember, and there I am, the little face on the right. Uh, yeah, there I am, yeah. <laughs> Sneaking into the photo. Um, and I was, one of the things I was in charge of with Harry was the Yankee Stadium concert. We did this great concert for him. And, Mr. PR genius, I said to him before, I said, uh, you know, uh, he wasn't president. Mr. Mandela, um, if you put on a Yankee hat, that's the, that's the photo that's going to go. He says, you're pretty good at this, but just watch me. And it's not quite captured here, but when you see clips of him in New York, 
he goes, and I am a Yankee. And that, putting the hat on, is the shot you see all the time in, in compendium uh, photos and video of what he did. And this was the shot on, uh, at Yankee Stadium. Um, so I am about ready to think about what the hell I'm going to do with myself, because I did not want to stay in government. My deal was one year. And it's interesting. I, I, Reverend Al Sharpton. Reverend Al Sharpton was raised in hell. He had the first black mayor of New York. Sharpton is social and political activist, and he's beating us up all the time. And Bill Lynch says, why don't you just meet with him? You know, you have this odd way and this odd role. He said, because I can't, I can't deal with it. Dinkins was ready to, he hated, he hated what Sharpton was criticizing. So I call Sharpton and he says, well, all right, I'll meet with you. Meet me, it was like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, some restaurant in Harlem. And Sharpton has told me later, he didn't think I was going to show up. And, you know, alone, there I was, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Uh, oh, this is, this is my boyfriend, <laughs> Harry, you know, this is a, the Harry Belafonte. We could talk about it later, but that's one of my uh, favorite shows. And we're secret boyfriends of each other uh, over many years. But this was Reverend Al in those days. And he wore jumpsuits, and he was, uh, had the big hair. But there was just something about, we just clicked. And we would make each, we'd make each other laugh all the time. We'd tell Michael Jackson stories. It goes back in the music business. And we hit it off, and it became this odd but very close friendship that exists uh, right now. And I met him trying to get him to cool it with Mayor Dinkins, ironically. So uh, what could I say? The, I leave city government. I am going to be an entrepreneur. I'm in my 40s. I wanted a life change. What the hell did I know about being an entrepreneur? But I said, well, it's going to be entertainment, and it's going to be political cause saving the world. And I cold called Barbara Streisand. And I said, uh, and I knew her a little bit from politics. We had the Bergmans and other friends of mine. Would you be my first client? Pause. And, OK. And she's been my client ever since. And she's arguably the greatest entertainer ever. And got new projects and going stronger than ever. And we have this sort of unique friendship. And the other first client was a guy named Bill Clinton. This is a later photo, obviously. We have these reunions all the time. Clinton was running for president. Uh, I did the PR for the Democratic Convention at Madison Square Garden in 1992. Then I went on the road part of the time with Bill as I was starting the business. And I didn't have a great business plan. I certainly didn't have, I'm going to make this much money this time. But I, you know, it was a little method to the madness in the areas that I excelled in. And the business was, was all me. I started literally with a staff of one, me. And then I slowly started hiring people. Seemed to be pretty good at this, but I wasn't impatient. I didn't need to make all this money right away. And I would say no to clients. That's another lesson. I'll, t I'll give you some lessons at the end to the extent any of this makes sense for any of you. Is it, it, It's got to feel right for you if you want to be entrepreneurial in the way I did it. And we started growing. And I started hiring uh, some pretty smart young people. But they had no little experience in the higher levels of PR. And they were kind of my protégés. And some of them became superstars. And they run my company uh, now. Um, but I would always have these crazy experiences. And when we started with Barbara, um, she had uh, she came out of, she, she had not had a public concert for 27 years. And she opens the MGM Grand in Vegas. And we, um, every star you could name was there. I ended up with Michael Jackson after the show. And she, um, uh, he says, he goes backstage, you know, the greatest entertainer ever. So here I am with Michael Jackson. He was, you know, he, he was the biggest thing by far then. And he says, come on, let's go out. It's, new, it's late at night, it's 1 in the morning. I said, all right, we're doing this stretch limo with all these bodyguards. I don't know where we're going. We go into this place. I realize it's a strip club. And I'm in a strip club with Michael Jackson. Um, <laughs> and you know, you get lap dances in a strip club. I mean, I've been to strip clubs before. It's not these days. It doesn't mean anything. I think it's a little weird. I realized I had about $11 to my name. You're supposed to give tips. 
And it's two in the morning. Mike is giving hundreds. And you know, these girls are dancing. There's not much else going on. I fell asleep in the strip club next to Michael Jackson. And <laughs> the uh, bodyguard woke me up. And they gave me a ride home. And I was so embarrassed. You know, I missed the PR genius. I was literally conked out there. Um, but I'll never forget it. He would kid me about it all the time, you know, with that laugh that he had. You fell asleep in a strip club. Um, and uh, it's soon after that, I, I'm having lunch with him at what's now Cipriani's. It was Sherry Netherland Hotel. It was very fancy. This New York society is there, and you had to get dressed up. But I wasn't really dressed up. And they, you know, poo pooed me, but oh, yes, Mr. Jackson is waiting for you in the back. And I go to the table, and his manager then, Frank DeLeo, is there. And he was a big guy with a big cigar, literally smoking. He could smoke then, smoking a cigar at the Sherry, which was pretty weird. And I'm saying hello to Mike, and he's dressed in his thing. And I look next to me, and it's a monkey. It's Bubbles, his monkey, is eating at the table with me. And I, one thing I knew about Mike, when animals play it, you've you got to play along. You can't act like you know, you're some fancy politician. So I'm having a conversation with Bubbles in front of Michael. And he made point you were very respectful to Bubbles you know, at that lunch and at other times. And you know, I figured, I don't know, somehow my Cornell training prepared me for this insanity. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, Bubbles, by the way, is still alive and is a painter now. They're selling Bubbles paintings on the internet. You know, you guys are more real world. This is a little bizarre. In my world, this is sort of, you know, you go along with it. You, you don't get any bigger than Mike in those, uh, those days. And ironically, we represent Janet, his sister now. And she's on tour, and she's killing it, uh, as always. Um, the um, the uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. became a really good friend of mine. And, I actually um, he started uh, George Magazine, which way before your time, but it was politics and show business. He would have very famous um, actresses dressed as historic figures. And of course, he wants Streisand to be the cover first. She took too long, wasn't the first, but he and I go out there for a photo shoot for her to be dressed as Betsy. John, you know, he was John F. Kennedy Jr., but he didn't quite get what show business is like and how you deal with. So we're at the photo shoot at a house. It's about 100 degrees. There are hundreds of people with different setups and photographers and dresses. And it's just, and, it's, and he said, this is insane. We haven't had one shot. It's going to bankrupt my magazine. I said, come on, let's take a walk. Calm down, John. So we go to the other end of the property, and there is a swimming pool. And so let's go in the pool. Said, you know, and again, the incident, the, the, the straight laced PR genius that I am, well, I can't, you know, go. We go splashing around in the pool. All of a sudden, you hear a blood curdling scream from the other end of the property. Who the hell is in my swimming pool? It's Barbara, dressed as Betsy Ross. This was the cover she ends up <laughs> chasing to see. She had these ex Mossad security people who I knew carried guns. I had visions of being shot to death naked in a swimming pool with John F. Kennedy Jr. <laughs> But somehow she comes and she says, Kenny, what do you do? She starts yelling at me. Then she sees John at the other end of the pool. He says, oh, John, how's the water? And, <laughs> and he, he repeated that story constantly. And you know, when he died, tragically, that, that versions of that story, that's kind of the real story. And it got embellished in all kinds of funny ways uh, later. Um, and this is an article uh, from uh, when he did I, uh, everybody that was close to books say, I would never do that. And I am maniacally protective of my relationships. And maybe it's one of the reasons I've done as well as I did. But there was a funny incident that uh, I had relayed, I guess, when he died. And we were, he campaigned for David Dinkins in Zabar's. Anybody know Zabar's in the West Side? And it's, uh, it, was, it caused a lox riot at Zabar's when he went in there. People screaming and carrying on. But you know, again, a little bit show business and, uh, and politics. Um, at a certain point in the 90s, I get invited to go to Cuba uh, with a celebrity group I'm helping to organize. And we, uh, yeah, that's my friend Jeffrey Saxon. You know, I met this guy. You meet, you, when, in those days, you met him at about midnight. And he made believe he didn't understand any English, except he did. And he talked to like 
6 in the morning. And another one, I didn't fall asleep because I was captivated, but it all had to be translated. My Spanish is not that good. But I had a pretty cool story. I just like this expression. And there I am with the, with the commandante. Um, the, one of the cool things in Cuba on that trip is among the celebrities was the star of a movie, Titanic. And he's the biggest star in the world, Leonardo DiCaprio. And we kind of hit it off a little, but he's with a bunch of his friends. And I said to him, you know, this is Cuba, bro. You, you better cool it, because anything goes on here, they'll put you in jail. They don't care who you are. This is not like Beverly Hills or, or, or the West Side. And we just sort of hit it off. His dad was on the trip, who's a great buddy of mine, uh, George DiCaprio. And he's become you know, one of the signature clients of, of Sunshine Sex for ever. Uh, I couldn't be prouder of his career path. We sometimes have something to drink together. I don't know where that is, just in black tie. Uh, I think this is at a Yankee game. Uh, having a good laugh. I mean, we just make each other laugh. And let me tell you, life is not so easy at the top. But the thing I'm most proud of, Leo, uh, this is at the White House. He showed his environmental doc. This is last year of Obama. Uh, at the White House, Obama hosted it. And uh, I guess that was the reception before overlooking the White House. Uh, the thing I'm most proud of him is his choice of films, the directors he works with, what he turns down and his environmental activism, which is unequaled, and just killing it and really wanting to impact the world and using celebrity to do good in the world, which is our mantra. And uh, you know, he's, uh, he's pretty something, that, uh, that Leo guy. Uh, obviously, I came to this school, so labor is a key part of our DNA. 1199, I, I did a, a something, one of the courses here, I can't totally remember. I went to 1199 when I was at the LR, ILR school. I had a feeling for that union. And I met the original heads of the union. Years later, Dennis Rivera here, who was the president for many years, is a great friend of mine. And we plotted and schemed. And uh, I think it's arguably the greatest union in the country. It's the most active. It's one of the largest. And it's not a great era for labor these days. But this union is killing it and till today. And they drive me crazy all the time. Um, we have all kinds of other clients that have nothing to do with labor, but I'll never forget. We represented the Transport Workers Union in New York when they went on strike uh, several years ago. You think PR is hard. You're keeping the subways and buses closed, and you're defending the guys keeping them closed. That was one rough uh, battle. Ended up making a deal. Bloomberg and the head of the union were clashing. Crazy. He went to jail because of the Taylor Law. Uh, but uh, it's among the experiences, you know, I'm trying to pick out little things that sort of stand out over all the things we've done over these years. That was certainly one of them, and a PR challenge, to say the least. Um, one of the longest, uh, client, longest term clients that we've had in the entertainment band realm is, uh, is Ben Affleck, who's a great actor and a terrific director. You know, his film won the Oscar a couple of years ago. Somewhere with the guy in the middle who we looked like we had a couple of drinks there. I don't know. But it, uh, I'd spent a lot of time with various political people and uh, our celebrities. Is my mic off? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. We're losing your other mic. Losing the other one. Okay. Um, the John Bon Jovi is another client of long standing. He's an iconic rock star. Uh, he's a great friend of mine. Uh, it's his wife, Dorothea, in the middle, and I don't know who the other two guys are. We, <laughs> we, we spent a lot of time politicking. I don't think anybody campaigned harder for Hillary than John. And there's nothing like you know, him to bring out a crowd. And people love to caricature celebrities and like to you know, make fun of them because they're celebrities. And a lot of them are, are, are make a lot of money, and they're very famous and very good looking. There aren't that many that put themselves out the way some of my guys do, and the women that work that we work with. And John is is, is just a pleasure to work with, and uh, uh, and one of the iconic rock stars of all time. We worked with Tyler Perry from the beginning. Tyler was doing shows. He was living out of his car not long before we started working with him. He was doing uh, his plays dressed as Medea in. Uh, on the road, I met him in Memphis, I think. I think it was Memphis. And we kind of hit it off. That's 13 years ago. 
We've worked with him on every film and all his projects since then. He's an incredibly complicated, brilliant businessman. And, you know, as a young guy whose acting is underrated. He's done some one-offs, not dressed like Medea, which this is a, his most famous role. Uh, does a lot of nonprofit work, always very quietly. Doesn't want PR, doesn't want press. Just give the money for this cause and just don't get it in the press. Um, Natalie Portman's been the client for a while, uh, another terrific actress and a, a superstar as a, both an actress as a, and as a philanthropist, again, very quietly. Uh, Lee Daniels has been a client for a while. Lee is the uh, creator and producer, executive producer of Empire, which is among the best, biggest shows on TV, and of course directed The Butler and a bunch of tremendous movies. Um, and he's a relatively young guy that's going to have an enormous future uh, beyond what he's done. J-Lo's been our client forever. She's maybe the smartest businesswoman I've ever met of female uh, stars. And she's literally nine clients in one. This was at the Tonys, I think. We were all dressed up. But she is really something, and she's Jenny from the block. And... Her, her activism with Puerto Rico right now is something I'm incredibly proud of, and she's had enormous uh, impact because of her celebrity. Her social media following is beyond, beyond. Uh, Bette Midler, what can I say about Bette, Bette Midler? She's, uh, she makes me laugh more than anybody. She says, I make her laugh more than anybody. We have this, this is at the Oscars. It's a kind of a cute photo. Um, and she's playing Hello, Dolly, for too much money, bet, but it's okay. For, I'm Broadway right now, and uh, I'm going to her Halloween party next week. But another great philanthropist. She's done more for city parks in, than I think anybody, and I couldn't be prouder of her. Uh, this guy, second from the right. So Luis Miranda, who's Lynn manuel Miranda's dad, who's on the far right. Who's the woman in the middle? All right, we're good. Um, he and I, we were kind of political consultants together around the same age, but he was like a real political consultant. And ironically, his wife, Luz, was in graduate school with my cousin and got pregnant. And she's complaining about her pregnancy. 37 years ago, she was pregnant with Lynn manuel Crazy relationships. Years later, I kind of talked to him apparently when he was in high school because they didn't know anybody in show business. I was there linked to show business. He goes to Wesleyan. He's a, obviously a very gifted student and a brilliant writer, but who knew? And I, I told him, I said, look, follow your dream. Don't ever, especially you're 22 years old, you get out of college, pursue you know, writing theater and doing uh, creative things. And you're so smart, you're probably not going to make any money doing it, but you know, your dad does OK. So he writes In the Heights in college. We start officially working for him off-Broadway. He goes to Broadway. He wins the Tony for Best Musical. And he's so smart and charismatic. And he has this crazy idea for a hip-hop musical about Alexander Hamilton. Yeah, Lynn, it's a great idea. And, uh, and I never thought, you know, it would happen. There was a poetry slam at the White House. Obama's were looking for people. I think we, I don't know, I think we got the call and said, Lynn, you write poetry. Maybe you'll do poetry. So I, maybe I could do a song. I'm writing this hip-hop musical. I'm rolling my eyes. Yeah, your hip-hop musical about Alexander Hamilton. He goes there. He does the song Alexander Hamilton, which opens the show. The first time it's performed publicly is at the White House. The Obamas go insane. And they're telling everybody, this kid from New York, this is the most brilliant, and Michelle particularly, just going crazy. And the Obamas went many times to see the show. Obviously, it opens on Broadway and arguably the biggest hit in the history of Broadway, but Lynn is really special. And his activism around Puerto Rico now, his philanthropy, and his demeanor are just unique on every level. I couldn't be prouder to represent him, and we're, you know, doing what he uh, When Michael Jackson passed, the, we did the PR for the family. It was a, we tried to keep it solemn. It was a little bit of of a zoo. Uh, I, I was a spokesman with the family, so they had me go on the Today Show with Reverend Sharpton talking about him. And we tried to put as much dignity in his memorial as we, 
as we possibly could. Um, yeah, this guy, this is a crazy photo. Uh, I was at an event with, I don't know, Spike Lee. I was with Spike, and he's videoing this supposedly private talk I'm having with the guy on my right. And he, he keeps trying to blackmail me, Spike does, about what he's going to do with that. Uh, the Obamas were really nice to me. They invited me to sit in the presidential box at the last Kennedy Center Honors where, when he was still president. Carol King, George Lucas, a lot of good gossip uh, that night. Um, uh, Bill de Blasio worked for me in City Hall when I was chief of staff. He was a kid. He was a tall, gangly one. We did, Nancy and I did the first fundraiser he ever did when he ran for the city council. Who ever would have thought? And I'd supported him from the beginning. A nice shot with David Dinkins here, who takes, deservedly takes credit for all of us. Uh, and he wins the mayoralty, and now he's walking into re-election, which is pretty crazy. Uh, I was the designated mediator between Cuomo and de Blasio. I'm not going to talk about it as much, except to say that I tried to mediate. I get an A for effort and an F minus for execution. But mayors and governors don't usually get along. And, you know, they're both pretty great. Uh, you know, and my role was meant. But I kind of like the shot because it looked like they're really listening to me. That's Shirlane McRae, you know, Bill's wife on my right. This is when they were still at least trying to let me mediate, but that didn't, uh, that didn't quite work out. Uh, these days, we also were newly representing Jane Fonda, who was, when I was at Cornell, I think I had posters of her in my dorm. <laughs> and I tell her about that. She said, was it the Barbarella photo? You know, she was very funny with it, but at the age of 80, she's going stronger than ever. Andrew Lloyd Webber is a relatively new uh, client of ours theater, royalty, he's got an autobiography that you're going to hear a lot about, it, or I'm not as good as I think I am uh, in, the next, uh, in the next year. The environmental world is a big world for us. Uh, we do a lot of work, represent virtually every environmental group, and it's one of the issues that I think this president is doing terrible things with. Um, the um, Women's March was our became our client. They're actually having a conference now. That's me at the Women's March, looking a little weird. Um, and we do, uh, obviously, a lot of work in the uh, advocacy world of people banding together to oppose the policies of this president. And I'll talk about that a little later. Um, some of my favorite little photos, John Lewis, one of my heroes, one of the uh, heroes of the Civil Rights Movement, almost got killed in Selma, Alabama is maybe the most uh, distinguished uh, congressman from Atlanta. Uh, and I, I could listen to him talk forever. And I met the Dalai Lama a couple of years ago. And he, he seemed to like my name. And it was just kind of a cool, um, a cool uh, uh, a photo. Uh, I hate, I, I don't, I, make, I have this funny uh, relationship to being recognized. I, I, there are these lists. and. What, what, where are you on the power list? And we have clients that sometimes come to us, can I, I want to be higher on the list. You know, I'm the behind the scenes guy. My mantra is I couldn't be happier behind the scenes. That's why doing this is a little weird. And a lot of my famous clients I think are watching me and probably saying I should stand up straighter or not talk like a New Yorker you know, as much as I do. But I, that's a role that I'm more than comfortable with. But we've been, you know, I get, I've gotten and the company's got recognized many times over the years, Brill's content, which doesn't exist anymore, said I was a maestro image maker representing blah, 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 blah. And the difference is he marries the worlds of politics as entertainment. Sometimes they throw me on these lists of power lists. One year I was 28. One year I was 91. One year I think I was higher. I didn't make it. I don't think it helped or hurt anything in the business. Uh, one year we were not on the city and state power list of PR agencies. I said to my partner, Sean, I said, why the hell, how could they not even put us on the list? So guess what happened the next year? We're number one, so we're the most powerful agency. I don't think it helped business, I don't know that, but it's nice to be recognized, I guess. And I got a caricature on the front cover of the New York Observer, uh, which was, I guess, cool, I don't know. Um, people honor me, want, they want to honor me all the time. I don't know, part of it is they think I have more money than I do and they want to check, or some of them, they think that I just have a unique success story to the extent I've had that. Um, but the ones I have accepted, I'm actually very proud of. Um, and most of them are for civil rights. These are, I guess they got a pretty good photo of a lot of them together. Um, 
The National Action Network uh, honored me for upholding the vision of Martin Luther King in the spirit of the 63 March on Washington. And my two guys came, this was a couple of years ago, we all looked a little younger. Uh, uh, Leo and Ben came to honor me at the event in LA. Uh, the Amsterdam News, which is I think the oldest, second oldest uh, African-American weekly based in New York, honored me a couple of years ago. The most fun of that is one of my real uh, heroes, uh, Hazel Dukes, was honored along with me, and she yelled at me the whole time, which was kind of, kind of fun. Uh, Bella Abzug, as I said, uh, was really as much my mentor as anybody. There's an institute at Hunter College that, uh, that they honored me years ago. There's actually some cute, uh, they got letters from a bunch of my famous clients. This is one from Ben Affleck. My name is Ben Affleck. I'm an actor and director and the guy whose checks you've been cashing for the last 10 years while you've been working hard on behalf of Leonardo DiCaprio. That was the start of it. He went to insult me. You know, Leo said, we know Kenny Sunshine has a long history in the civil rights. I remember seeing him go to Harlem. I've never experienced anyone receive more love from the African-American community. You know, my life, it's like walking in the room with a short Jewish Michael Jackson. <laughs> oh, Michael Jordan. I'm sorry, better, you know, Michael Jordan. City and state, uh, yeah, the Clintons, the Obamas, they all sent nice letters, which is kind of cool. I mean, it's fun to talk about that now. Um, they made me a lifetime winner of the most responsible New Yorker uh, last, uh, this year or last year, city and state did, and I got Sharpton and, and Mayor Dinkins to present it to me, which was kind of nice. Um, and my archives, my political archives, which seem to have some interest because I've been doing this so long, are at the LaGuardia Community College in, um, in, uh, in Queens. I'm on a lot of boards. That's when you, do. When you get old and you don't want to do much different. But there, people have hobbies. They play golf. They fly on jets. I go on boards. I'm on the board of City University of New York, CUNY, which is an incredibly important institution, higher education, all the challenges of higher education. I'm on the board of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is kind of fun. I'm not the type that usually goes on that board, but they seem to like me, and they've had some issues lately. I've been helping them on some of the press issues. Foundation for Ethnic Understanding, which uh, prioritizes Islamophobia, and the outbreak of that, uh, it, I'm, I'm on that board. I'm the board of the Community Service Society, which is leading advocacy for the poor in New York, going back to the 1800s. The Nation Institute, the Nation Magazine, I'm on that board. Board of an organization called SIX, which is to get progressives to run for state and local offices. Um, the Clintons. I've had this crazy relationship with them for a long time. This is a kind of, when I was a little younger, that's a good photo. It kind of typifies my relationship with Bill. I'm a little bit of a wise ass with him. He's like looking at me, but we have this great relationship and I, I love him to death. But I like her more, you know, she is just the best. And people don't get what a terrific person she is. And it didn't come across in the campaign, obviously. You know, I was crushed, to say the least, like a lot of people by the results of the campaign. Um, this is, I, I keep getting grayer in these shots. Um, and I've got to say, I was on the road with her a lot. I was very involved in the campaign. I was every celebrity I've ever met. I pushed to get involved in the campaign. And in a million years, I didn't think she'd ever lose. <laughs> she loses. Uh, that's a shot with Leo, and that's with Bon Jovi. And this was a debate. I went to the debates, and I worked on people. We were we going to really change the course of America. And she, I was with Nancy the, the night. Of, it was a blur the night of the loss. We were at the Javits Center waiting for the victory speech. The next morning, she invites me to the concession speech. I'm up in the, in the balcony there at the hotel, which is it's like a blur. And I frankly haven't gotten over it yet. Um, and we can talk about some of that in the Q&A. Uh, Medgar Evers College, which is part of CUNY, uh, honored her. She was a commencement speaker. I'm in a cap and gown. That was the last time uh, we met. Um, I, we can talk politics all we want. I, I had a whole section I was going to talk about how crazy things are. And all, but I'd rather that come out in the Q&A. These are the lessons I want to leave with you <clears throat> about my crazy career. One, be comfortable being an outsider. I wasn't a jock at Cornell. 
I wasn't, I wasn't a real activist. I, it dominated my life, but I, was, I had a foot in the Democratic Party, but it wasn't cool enough. So I had this crazy relationship that continues to this day, with the insider and the outsider. Being the outsider is great, and you don't have to fit a bag. Uh, be true to who you are. I became, I was a great rebel in Democratic politics, then for a while piece of, people are kissing my butt, and then I'm the outsider again. It's all cool, it's all fine. And don't get caught up with having to be in the in crowd. Hang in there. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. Most people don't do it. I've got more energy than I ever did. I want to conquer the world more, particularly these days with what's going on in DC. And don't ever get bored or cynical. Um, make your professional life fulfilling. People you know, go to a place like Cornell, they go to graduate school, they get the job that they always want, it's gonna make them a lot of money, and they're miserable. By the time they're 30, by the time they're 40, they're in therapy, what am I doing with myself? It, it, I've had all kinds of peaks and valleys in my career, and it's not a traditional one, but you don't have to follow that traditional path to have some success and to have some fulfillment. Um, learn to trust others and give them power if you're becoming entrepreneurial. I'm pretty good at PR, I'm good at meeting people, I have a certain reputation. I'm terrible at running things. I can't manage my own life. Nancy manages literally every aspect of, 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 my, uh, of my, my personal life, you know, with money and all that. I learned to trust these kids that I hired years ago to run, that's now a business of 170 people, and they're my guys. It's like a dysfunctional, wonderful family. I trust them implicitly, and this business will live way beyond me. Um, be proud of who you are. Don't try to be what you're not. When I was at Cornell, I was just all over the place. But again, I didn't fit anybody's bag. I wasn't a frat boy. I wasn't a jock. But I wasn't really a crazy radical. Whatever it was, it seemed to uh, work out. Learn how to write for the real world. Write, everybody here can write. You know, you get into Cornell and you know how to write. But you don't, have a, you don't, have a, you don't have, know how to write for a business like mine. And, and mine is a particular kind, writing a press release, dealing with media, capsulizing complicated statements into one paragraph, the use and, and, and the use of video, which now of course is so important. Learn to master those skills. Read everything. I read seven newspapers a day. I read every political blog you can imagine and probably everything in the entertainment world. It's not for normal people, but it's an example. You gotta stay current, you gotta stay on top of everything. One good, I don't need a lot of sleep. So I, I'm in the office ridiculously early hours. That's personally, you don't have to be, it's not a message for everybody, but it works for me. I don't need that much uh, sleep. Um, learn how to network, work contacts, look somebody in the eye. I know it's an old fashioned concept. Learn how to schmooze. It's a Yiddish word that really, meet people, work people. People, how'd you, how'd you meet all these people? I don't know, I just met them. And I had a unique, my name got, was attractive on some level or whatever it is, but learn how to schmooze. Today's era, because everybody's doing this all day, they don't look at anybody in the eye, learn to go against that. People ask, am I ever gonna retire? Never, you know, I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing forever, I don't know. Maybe I'll join more boards, you know, five may not be enough. And uh, lastly, uh, this one's a friend of mine who went to Cornell. Uh, this is a motto with the Eddy Street gate. I don't know, where the hell is Eddy Street? It used to be the entrance to the campus, the, the old campus, but this saying actually capsulizes uh, what I took out of Cornell, although I never saw, knew about the saying until recently. And it's, do service to country and mankind. Don't always be interested in yourself and making money. There are other things you can do in life. And by the way, you may make a couple of bucks on the road. Anyway, thank you for the opportunity. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. We have time. We're uh, a little short. We're, we're going to go to our panels in just a few minutes, but one or two questions. Hi. So you mentioned you felt that Hillary wasn't able to really portray her or who she was through her campaign. So what do you think she could have done differently in retrospect now knowing what went on? You know, it's, I mean, I could give you the four hour version. I was a big supporter of the campaign. A lot of people like me were bitching about the campaign. Campaigns are a mess. When you, and I was semi inside the campaign. They were trying everything. You know, she should have gone to Wisconsin. She should have gone 
to the, the Pennsylvania. I was with her in Pennsylvania 10 times, I think, and I, she was there more, many, many more times than I was. Um, somehow, TV doesn't do her justice. And it's also the phenomenon of Donald Trump. Donald Trump, look, what, more than Hillary, he beat 16 Republicans in the primary by being as vulgar and as mean and as nasty and caricaturing crazy terms about people. It actually worked in Republican primary. Now, I, we thought in the general public that wouldn't work against somebody as obviously qualified as she. Um, and, you know, the idea that people didn't, would, would vote for him it still kind of amazes me considering how he's acted as president. Here's the real issue. Voting. It's your generation. If millennials voted anywhere in the numbers that my generation did, she would have won easily. You know, she certainly would have won those three states, uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin that she lost. And I, look, I get that she wasn't cool like Obama, and she wasn't, uh, she, she wasn't, you know, maybe there were some issues that the Republicans effectively caricatured, the emails and stuff like that. But I got to tell you, forget everything else. Forget my personal view. Uh, and the issues, environment, LBGT issues, human rights, choice, immigration. Most Americans agree with her. They don't agree with Trump, whatever he stands for, because I don't, he, half the time he changes his mind midstream. Um, shouldn't that matter rather than personality if you're in love with Trump's personality and not hers? So I don't know what she could have done, um, but... TV doesn't do her justice. Uh, just a reminder before we take the last question, Ken is going to be in the panels. He's also going to be at the reception later on. So if you do have more questions, I'm sure he'll take them impromptu there. One more? Yes, sir. Hi, Ken. Thank you for coming. My name is Joe DiVolio, and I have a question. Uh, everyone here, at the very least, has some sort of affiliation with ILR. Some of us, like you and I, love the place. I'm wondering what you learned here that was so transferable into your success and what you've become today. See, it's interesting. Right? We, we were talking before. <clears throat> I think it had a big influence on me, but I didn't realize it till later. Because I didn't pursue, I, I didn't go into the labor world. I, I didn't... You know, I have a lot of labor clients and certainly political affiliations there. But I think it, it taught me, um, it backed up some of my gut arguments on things. I think it taught me how to think. I think it taught me how to discipline my thinking. I met some terrific professors and a lot of great students here. But the truth is, if, you know, this is 50 years ago, so you know, I was here in the Stone Age. I, I remember the politics more because it did dominate life and it certainly dominated my life more. You know, classes were canceled a lot of the time, you know, because of the, the turmoil. So the academic part of it, frankly, doesn't, I don't remember as well. But it, it's just, it was, I always had a great feeling about it. And I, truth is, I hate to, I had a lot of fun too. So, yeah. Thank you, Ken. And thank you again for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you.